Before we start, everybody should, who is following along and wants to make, I'm waving at the camera like you can see me, everybody who is following along and wants to see how we make this, they need to go to my uh, GitHub repository, uh, Roman Gamer, and then go to the Corona Geek sub repository. <clears throat> and below this, you're going to find a folder called Hangouts. And within Hangouts, we'll give you the direct link in the show. There's a there's a folder called I Can Make That. And it's under here that all the different games that we will make over time will live. And so currently, the only game that's under here is Zigzag Boom Clone. And when you finally get to this level, be it from the direct link or crawling through the repository, uh, you'll find a README, which gives some links to get, uh, to get the game to download it so you can play it, some videos so you can watch it and then a discussion of what you're going to find in these different folders. So, let me go ahead and close this up. I'm sorry, I have a multiple desktop set up here. There's my wife, sneezing in the background again. <laughs> I'm going to have to close my, I'm going to have to close my door. Alright, so the game that we're uh, remaking is an endless um, runner style game in the sense that uh, the level just continues forever and ever and your player is moving through the level. It's not actually running, but it's close enough to call it an endless runner. Within this game, our goal is to get our player, which is a, basically a, a dot that is emitting particles, to move left and right through a hallway, which just zigzags over time. It either zags to the left or zags to the right. Your player moves at a 45 degree angle left or a 45 degree angle right. And the way we achieve this is through touching the screen. So it's a one-touch game. Touching the screen changes your mov movement from the right to the left or left to right. And your whole goal is to not run into the wall. And so every time you pass a corner, you get another point. And the more corners you pass, the higher your score. Pretty straightforward. So... It sounds simple. It sounds simple. But it's very hard. <laughs> there are, yeah, besides the playing part, Implementation in this game, I'm going to give you a hint. The hardest thing to do in this game is to make the path. It, it, you would think that the path would be like pretty straightforward, but uh, unless you have a background in 2D math, you'll soon discover that making a path that goes at a 45 degree angle and zigzags back and forth and getting the walls to connect to each other and setting up the collision is it's not a huge feat, but it you know, without the background, it becomes somewhat intractable. So next week we will we will dive into how to make the path. But this week, I just want to give an overview of how the project is going to be organized, so people can follow along. So uh, I've already shown you the layout of the folders, but within here we have one called App, and I've decided that within App. Every time I make a new version of the game, I'll create a new subfolder that has that version. So this lets people follow along and they get to see the mistakes that I've made as I go along. They can compare the two versions to see what the differences in the code are. Uh, and it just gives them the ability, if they wish, to walk through the entire video series that we'll produce and look at the exact code that we're talking about at the time. So I use kind of a strange naming convention. Most people find it strange. Uh, what it is, uh, first is ZZBC, which is just zigzag boom clone underbar. And it may be a little bit hard to read on my screen because I can't make this very large. But then I end the file, the folder name, with um, the format is year, year, month, month, day, day. And the reason I do this is because I'm one of those computer geek kind of guys who wants my files to be sorted for me in an increasing order or a, uh, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for here? Ascending? Ascending, there we go, in an ascending order. And so I know that year, year, month, day will always ascend, it'll always be organized correctly. Uh, people who use uh, day, month, year, that always confuses the heck out of me. I can't figure out what came first because, you know, 090909, what are we? Okay, that one's pretty clear, but 090807, uh, I'm confused. You know, two, 2007, 2009, 2008, September, August, what's going on here? So it's going to be ZZBC under bar something, and it'll always be 15 because I think we'll get this done in 2015, the month and the day. 
So the folder we're working with today is 0, uh, 150223, 23rd of February. So within here, the important part is the way I lay out my projects is the first thing I try to do is minimize the number of folders that are going to be in the root folder. And the root folder is the, basically the folder where the main.lua file is. I limit this to contain the main.lua file, the config.lua file, build settings, any fonts that I'm using, and then eventually some icons for the app when we upload it to the uh, App Store. <clears throat> After that, everything lives in folders. My common folders are an images folder, a scripts folder, and a sounds folder. And then for 99.9% .9 of my projects, you will also see SSK, which is my starter kit, the super starter kit, which is a huge collection of helper bits and pieces that I've written. So I'm going to take you on a quick tour of main.lua, and then I'm going to explain a critical feature of how this game is laid out, and then we'll go and move on to the transitions. The one thing I like to do with main.lua is I like to keep it super short. So mine's basically about 70 lines long, <clears throat> and as we proceed, it's not going to get much longer than that. If it gets over 100 lines, I'll be surprised. And most of this is going to be comments. Functional code, we're probably talking about 20, 25 lines of code. The reason I do that, well, I just don't like to put important code in the main Lua file. You sometimes see people make projects where the whole game or the whole application is written in main and maybe like one other file. And that may work, but over time you're going to find that it's uh, very hard to maintain. You're not going to be able to take that project later and use it for something else, uh, repurpose it. So I set my games up and my apps up so that I can repurpose them quickly. I can take a game, because I don't know if you're like me, but I will work on a game and I'll get partway through it and i say, this, this game is fun, but what if I tweaked this mechanic? Well, now you're stuck. You can either create two versions within the same game where you've got two different mechanics and you've got to select them somehow. Or you can make a copy of your game, set it aside, make that little tweak, and then go back and work on your original game. And pretty soon you've got several games that came out of the one and you've repurposed it over and over. So even as I was working on this example, I started thinking, wow, what if we changed the hallway and made it turn on its side? That'd be interesting. Oh no, we have to do the original clone. So... <laughs> I may be repurposing this myself later. Anyways, um, the organization of main Lua, what you're going to see in here is uh, I put in my case error detect code. We talked about this a few shows back. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a helper script. What it does, it will det <clears throat> detect if we typo file names. Uh, for example, if we try to load a image file and it's um, Big Bob, all lowercase, and then I put Big Bob with capital B, That'll work great in the simulator, but when you get to the device, it will fail. So having these two lines of code at the top will catch those errors. Basically what this is doing is setting up some code that will double check all my subsequent calls to make sure I'm doing the right thing. It'll try to find the file. If you can't find it, it'll warn me that you couldn't find the file so that we don't get surprised later when we go to install this on our devices. <clears throat> in the future, people can just leave this in there when they... Um, upload this and, and uh, build it for their device because it will turn itself off if it's not on the simulator. Or you could simply comment it out. Either way is fine. All right, usually put a little copy <coughs> copyright statement at the top of the file. I like to uh, label the file so you know what file you're in, as if you couldn't tell in the editor. Um, then I go through some stages. I have what's called a pre-initialization stage, which is where I set up any globals that I might need in my libraries or um, maybe I initialize, like in this case, initialize the uh, random seed for the random number generator. <clears throat> and the reason I do this is, if you'll notice here on line 16, I've got a global variable called game font. Well, game font is used in the super starter kit. Super starter kit has all kinds of code in it. And among those bits of code, it's got a couple of libraries for making buttons and sliders and 
all wid widgety-like stuff, but not using the widget library. And what I did was, as I wanted to make it universally uh, modifiable, in the sense that I wanted to be able to choose my font anytime I needed it. And so I initialize a global called game font to just some font that I've chosen for this project, Adalon Serial. And then when SSK loads the first time, which is on line 22, it will initialize all of those libraries, and they will use game font from then on as the, the default font for the buttons and whatever other things that I'm using a font for. So the next section is uh, the requires section. And I always require SSK first, and then I will require, in this case, one additional file, which is the game module. And I'm going to get to that in a second. Speeding through here, the next part of this is uh, what I call general initialization. Stuff like I hide the display bar. If I need multi-touch activated, I activate multi-touch. OK, so uh, let's get to the sticky bits, the important part. So I told you how the project is organized in terms of layout. I've got images. I've got scripts. I've already got a bunch of scripts in here, but they're all placeholders. i got a sounds file. And under here, I've got my music, which is my soundtrack. And then sound effects, SFX, which is little short sounds to go with like uh, hitting the wall, or your player dies, or button clicks, stuff like that. All short sound effects go in here. So those are the assets. Where did you, where did you uh, source the, uh, the audio? So, yes. Uh, first of all, if we back up a little bit and we go into the zigzag boom clone, you're going to find a folder called assets. And under here, you're going to find all of the same files, but I will give you the location where I got them. There'll be a It'll either be a readme or a source.txt file, which if we open, it'll show you, oh, this is where I got it. Uh, and then I didn't put the license there. Um, I, I should probably do that. But that it's a free, um, you know, I can't think of the right license name right now. They're free. They're open. And I don't think you have to give them a link or a credit. But I'll double check on that. The way I'm organizing this project is so that we can get done with it and then shoehorn it in and use Composer to give it a nice framework, a splash screen, main menu, and all that stuff. But what we're doing initially is purely working on the gameplay part of the game. We're going to work on the, the, the play GUI, the, the part where you're playing the game. None of the menus, none of that good stuff. And so all of these scripts here are related to gameplay. Now, one of the conundrums, this is really hard, I, I struggled to find a way to describe this to people, so bear with me. There are basically two ways you can organize your code. What you're going to get when you write any game or app is that you're going to organize your code into modules. That is, if you use modules, and you'll have, for example, a module that is responsible for creating the player character. And you'll have another module that is responsible for making the pathway or the walls in this particular game. Then you may have a module whose responsibility it is for setting up the um, touch handling. So the one touch portion of our game and doing, providing you a way to do the input and send that input to the other parts of the game that care about it. And that's the part where it gets really confusing um, for people who are new to programming or just in general um, is how do I organize my project so that the different modules can all talk to each other but I don't get like uh, circular loops where one, one module needs to know like module no, module A needs to know about module B but module B also needs to know about module A well you can't require B into A and A into B because Lua won't allow that so the your other way of doing this is using the event system. Lua provides, not Lua, uh, Corona provides a event system, which allows us to create our own custom events and custom event listeners. Now, we use events all the time, but people don't think much beyond touch events and collision events and stuff like that. But there's a whole series of events that you can create on your own. I'm going to step back for just a second here. 
Uh, I said that here that I'm loading SSK, and I said last week, with SSK, we're going to use a couple things out of here. One of the things we're going to use is the global variables that come with SSK. I have a whole bunch of global variables to get up, uh, set up right away. Uh, and I know people, people are going to be shouting at me about this, but I'm just going to do it anyways. I've got shorthand notations for the width of the screen, the height of the screen, center of the screen, both X and Y. I also have shorthand notations for full width and full height, which is if you set your game up and you're using um, story, uh, no, uh, what is it called? Composer? No, no. Director? No, no in config.lua. <laughs> if you are using Letterbox. Letterbox is going to try to retain the aspect ratio of your game. So if your game was designed to designed to uh, 320 by 480, but the device doesn't have that aspect ratio, it's going to scale it in such a way that it still retains that, but there will be portions of your screen which are unused. They're extra. Like, for example, this game would fit on an iPhone 5, but there would be extra pixels at the top and the bottom of the screen because the iPhone 5 is has an aspect ratio equivalent to uh, 320 by 5 something. I can't remember the number. I always use small ones. I use the original iPhone 4 resolutions as my game design. The point is, is that when you're using Letterbox, um, there will be bits. There could be bits and portions of your screen that are unused because they're not part of your game design resolution. Your your screen is taller or wider than it expects, and it doesn't know what to do with it. So. Um, I have some variables where I calculate the true width of the screen, the true height of the screen, and I also, these are really critical, I pre-calculate the left side, the top side, the bottom, and the right side of the screen so I can position things relative to the edges, not relative to my design space, which may be different from the final device. The point of this is, is that you're going to see me using variables like w, and center X and center Y all throughout the design, and they came from SSK. I defined them once. They're globals. I know people don't like globals. It's like people think globals are evil, but in this case, globals are necessary. There's there's certain uses for globals, and I find this is one of them. All right. So uh, I know that this has been a rather long, a circuitous discussion. So the um, the key points that we've covered here. Organization of the um, files, very few in the root directory. Folders that contain images, scripts, sounds, and the SSK library. Main.lua, although it looks kind of long, it's mostly comments and it contains very little. It basically requires, I say include, so I'm a C guy, so I say include when I mean to say require. It requires SSK. It requires the game module, which is, and I didn't say this yet, game, the game module for our game is the master of all creation. It's the one that is in charge of talking to all the other modules, creating the player, creating the path, using the other modules to do the work. And I'm going to jump there in just a moment. Some initialization stuff that I would say, you know what, just skip right over this. If you're new, don't even care. Just use it directly. Worry about what it means later some debug stuff that we might turn on at a future date. And then we get down to the guts of this. And this is all our game does to start up. First, I call the init function in game, and it does initialization stuff. We're not going to cover that today. And then I'll probably, the next thing I'll do is start the game. So set it up and start it. And that's all there is to it. 